Okay, good morning again. Anybody run in the Kyoto Marathon yesterday? You know, did it happen? It was cold and wet, right? Did people run? None of you are <laughs> not sporty people, All right? Okay, good to see you again. I hope you had a good weekend. Um, following the order that we've, the original the syllabus was set up in, what we want to discuss this week is really this concept of sustainability for several reasons. One is obviously that if you're talking specifically about disasters, then of course, the ideal is that any post-disaster scenario would be sustainable, right? It's not just an emergency uh, reaction to the event itself. And in fact, the, the, unfortunately, the, the history of responses to disasters is often quite negative in this way. You know, obviously there's the need for emergency housing, food, water, shelter, and so on, uh, in the very initial stages of, of say, a natural disaster, okay? But then the question is what happens next, right? How long do people remain in that situation? Now, even here, right, a very advanced, rich country, after the Kobe earthquake, there were people still living in temporary housing in these kind of like containers, you know, that have been adapted into like at least three years after the event. Okay, uh, it's not necessarily a good idea, right? Obviously, that would be very difficult for people who couldn't foresee a future, couldn't reestablish their economic life, right? Very difficult to reestablish social ties and this kind of stuff. Okay, so it's it's very common. So one issue is re relates to the question of disaster specifically. The other big question, of course, is is the more general question of sustainability, in terms of any kind of social future. Would you agree? As somebody has very wisely said, if we don't have a sustainable future, actually we don't have a future, <laughs> right? Or at least there there are people. There are some very negative <laughs> negative thinkers out there. People who've written books about you know, the, the very unpleasant possible scenarios of the future. That the future would be a bit like the Middle Ages. You know, we'd be living in very primitive conditions. Oil will have run out. We probably won't have electricity. You know, society will be violent. People will be competing for very limited resources amongst themselves. There won't be much cooperation between people. You know, very, very unpleasant kind of future scenario which potentially is possible unless we do something about the issues, right? Okay, so what I want to do today is to talk about the basic concept of sustainability. You know, you're familiar with the basic idea, but we want to unpack it a little bit. Then on Wednesday, we want to look at some suggestions about sustainable solutions, okay? You know, otherwise people get very depressed. You know, we talk about all the problems and then we go away, <laughs> leaving you with, oh, what, what do we do next, right? To try to solve some of these problems. So that will be the order in which we're gonna go. So let's, let's today look at the basic concept of sustainability and um, start with this. Okay, so the, the notion of sustainability then applies not only to like post-disaster situations, it applies to basically any future social scenario, right? Whether that's economic, you're looking at it from an ecological point of view, or actually whether you're looking at it from a social or cultural point of view. Uh, I remember once, I used to bring students to uh, India on field trips all the time, okay? And I remember one time, we used to have a series of lectures, and one, one time we were in Bangalore, we had a lecture from the head of the Gandhi Studies Center at Bangalore University. You, know, you all know about Gandhi, right? Uh, he was very Gandhian. He was just, you know, Gandhi, the future, a simple life, back to the village, you know, wearing what we call khadi, you know, the homespun kind of clothing and this kind of stuff. And then after he finished, there was question time, right? And we had some questions. So I, I have a question. Okay, he said, if we all become Gandhians, we all return to this simple future, he said, what are we going to do in the evening? He said, what? He said, I don't understand your question. He said, well, after we all become Gandhians, we have this simple life, we return to the village. What are we going to do in the evenings? Will there be Gandhian movies? You know, non-violent movies. You know, no Rambo, no, no explosions, no car chases, no, no guns, you know, this kind of stuff. And he said, you know, I had never thought about that. Was, what he had not thought about was what a cultural future would look like 
in a sustainable world. You know, we tend naturally to think of ecology, possibly economics, right? But we don't tend to think about culture, all right? And I think we should because that's an important question, right? What, what, what will we do in the evening, right? What kind of literature, what kind of movies, what kind of theater, what kind of, what kind of uh, entertainment would we imagine for ourselves in a, in a sustainable future, socially and culturally sustainable, that maybe follows from ecological and economic sustainability? Okay, so it's, it's a broad question. Right, it doesn't only apply to you know narrow like or not narrow but ecological processes. Okay, so as you say, the basic premise is that any recovery process, and probably need to recover from the present as well. Right, some people would argue we're already in a mess. Right, our planet is not doing too well. Right, would have to be sustainable. Uh, if not, there's likely to be a future of some kind, but it probably wouldn't be a very livable one. Right? It wouldn't be pleasant. Ecologically degraded, uh, again, potentially with levels of violence high because of competition for scarce resources, you know, a breakdown of social um, unity between people. So you, know, you have a lot of alienation. You, know, or, or, you, know, you can imagine a very, very negative picture if you want to draw it that way. And say so some people have written whole books on this. Right? And the unfortunate thing is they're not actually just science fiction. You could imagine a so-called dystopian. You know, if utopia is the ideal, you know, you can imagine a dystopian future in which everything's gone wrong, violence, social breakdown, lack of resources, uh, and all this kind of stuff. Okay, so I assume that's not what we want, right? And as many people have pointed out, there is an ethical issue here. The ethical issue is what kind of world would one generation want to pass to the next generation? Say, so, sorry guys, here's your, here's your present. You know, it's, it's terrible, it's a mess, it's degraded, it's violent, it's horrible. And so sorry about that, but you know, good luck, <laughs> right? Okay, and say, well, it was your fault. You know, at least, at least you, didn't, you didn't respond enough to at least try to identify the problems and head them off or, or mitigate them in some way, okay? So obviously, that's not, I assume that's not what we want. So there is a very, very famous definition of sustainability, which you may have already heard. This comes from the 1987 World Commission on Environment and Development, which is often called the Brundtland Report. The chairperson of that committee was Mrs. Brundtland, who had been the Prime Minister of Norway. Right? So often you see this word Brundtland report, uh, it, it refers to, to this report. And in the course of that report, they came up with the definition of development, which you hear constantly repeated. There are many others. In fact, something I read recently suggested someone who'd surveyed the meanings of sustainability said they found 80 different definitions. But we're not going to get into 80 definitions, okay? Let's stick with the classic one, okay? There it is, okay? They were talking about development specifically, right? And the definition they came up with was that sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. So, can you read it? Sorry, it's not too far again. Okay? Uh, two, two issues then, right? First of all, obviously, we're responsible for our contemporary situation. You know, we have to address pressing problems. For example, poverty. You can't say, oh, you know, leave this to the next generation. Don't, don't worry about it, right? We need to address the current issues. And that creates its own problems and dilemmas. For example, ecologically, again, I don't know what you mean, if some of you are working in your projects, and so on, of various kinds. This is often an issue that, you know, you, you want to promote forestation forests, because forests are carbon sinks, they, they cool the environment, they, they're nice to look at, right? They produce fruit and all sorts of stuff, right? But obviously many poor, many poor communities have to cut trees basically because it's the only source of firewood. What are you gonna cook on unless you provide them with an alternative, okay? So you have a kind of tension there. On the one hand, you want to promote you know, the health of forests. On the other hand, you wanna solve issues of poverty and how are you gonna find some kind of dialogue between those uh, 
those, those, those two slightly, not contradictory, but there's some tension. Okay, so obviously we need to we need to address the, the the current the current issues, but we should not compromise the ability of future generations to a desirable lifestyle. Okay. Now again, that has hi, come in, welcome. That has a lot of implications. Okay, and we'll talk about some of the criticisms of this definition in a minute. Okay. What would our responsibility be? And I used to try this experiment with my students, right? We can, we can, we can do it in class if you want to have fun doing this. One of the experiments used to get, we always used to have a, a kind of orientation camp. Do you have this at Kyodai? You know, the beginning, just before your first semester, we'd all go off to YMCA or somewhere in the countryside and we'd have a, like two days of get together and, and this kind of stuff. And we used to do little exercises. One of the little exercises we used to give them sometimes was, Imagine a post-oil society, okay? What would it be like? Okay, and if you start to think about this, it's kind of actually quite a fun issue to think about, also a bit scary. It's not only the question of transport. Obviously, cars would become rare and probably only owned by maybe the government or the extremely rich. Forget air travel, <laughs> right? You know, you want to go anywhere, you're going to have to take a sailing ship, probably because long distance sea transport also depends on fossil fuel, right? Okay, uh, if you think of the number of things in the environment that are made of plastic, plastics are oil-based, okay? And you know, the, list is, the list is huge, your, your lighting, your heating, say your transportation, your textiles, your daily utensils, and probably half this stuff and so on, would disappear. The question is, does this mean a return to a kind of primitive lifestyle, or are we smart enough to work out a model of the future which could reutilize resources in different kind of ways? By the way, there are models of that. Um, any of you into sailing as a sport? I used to sail, I used to love sailing. Now, sailing's become very, very high tech. In fact, I don't like it much anymore because it's become too high tech. I mean, boats used to be made of wood. The sails were made of canvas, you know, the mast was made of wood as well, right? Nowadays, they're mostly made of plastic. Everything's made of plastic. The hull's made of plastic, the, the, the mast is made of aluminium, the, uh, the uh, sails are made of some sort of synthetic material, right? So it's kind of lost its charm in many ways. But the point is that some of those yachts are extremely efficient. And people have worked with this idea of, in fact, if you utilize that kind of technology that comes from yachts, from sporting sailing, applied to commercial shipping, you could, in fact, have very efficient shipping using sailing ships. It would still be slower, right, and less reliable. You might not be able to predict the exact time the ship is going to arrive somewhere, okay, but it would be zero carbon, basically, except in the manufacture of the ship or the, the components. You know, the, no fuel is involved at all, unless you had some auxiliary engine for like harp, getting into the harbor or something like this, right? So there are also things. So the question with the future generations is, are we actually using up all the resources which we should really pass on to the future generation, whether it's something like oil, whether it's something like the you know, beauty of physical environment, right? Well, whatever, any of those things. Okay, how do we find the balance between those, between those issues? In the report, they identify six core issues. And I think actually there are more, and we'll talk about those in a minute, but that's the ones they identify. First, they said population. The current, it depends who you talk to. If you talk to different demographers, they have slightly different models, okay? But there's a course happening here, right? One of the intensive courses on demography, professor, he's supposed to come from Shanghai, I don't know if he's come, you've seen the list of courses, there's one on demography. Demographers have different models, right, but one, one model is that the world population is likely to stabilize around 10 billion, okay, which is bigger than it is currently, but it will stabilize there for a number of reasons. Uh, it may be food supply, food security, things like this. It can be also to do with development, Japan has already passed the point which demographers call the demographic transition. 
The demographic transition is the point at which population grows to a certain point and then it spontaneously begins to decline. Okay, uh, Japan is in this situation, most of Western Europe is in this situation, the population is actually shrinking. I don't think there's population policy in Japan, is there? I mean, I'd be telling you, keep your family small. I think probably keep the family big you know, because the population is shrinking. I think it's probably increase your, your number of children because, you know, the, the, the straight line projects the current population of Japan is what, about 124, 125 million. It's predicted to drop to something like 80 to 90 million by the middle of this century. Huge decline. So the impact on rural life, countryside, farming, it's going to be very big, assuming that model is correct. Okay, And this is usually traced, the demographic transition is usually traced to high levels of development. People in poorer countries tend to have more children because they're a source of labor and security for your future. Right? In richer countries, the number tends to drop and drop and drop. In fact, I think in Japan, the current average birth rate is 1.5 children per family. Okay, which means below replacement rate. That's why it's declining. Okay, so unless you have lots of immigration or something like this, you know, the population is going to decline. Now, in fact, a lot of people here in the government here seem to think this a big problem. Oh, so many people, you know, pensions are going to be a problem. Less, you know, you guys are going to have to pay for us older people, right? This kind of stuff, this kind of problem. Ecologically, it's actually probably a very good thing, right? Pressure on resources will decline, of course, as the population drops. Consumption levels will decline. Now, capitalists hate this, of course. You know, not so many people to shop, right? <laughs> okay. But again, if you think of the positive consequence of population decline, it's actually not a bad thing. The problem is we're not at that point yet, right? And if population continues to rise to at least 10 billion globally, most of those populations will be in developing countries. And it's developing countries, of course, in which consumption is likely to continue to rise. Energy use is going to continue to rise. India, you know, where I currently live, the energy consumption rises dramatically annually. Okay? And a lot of it's coal-fired. Okay? So the, the issues with pollution, CO2, and so on, are all involved with this. So they identify population because clearly population is related to levels of consumption. And levels of consumption are related to the impact on the environment, what we're taking from the environment. Okay? That's obviously related to food security. You know, if you can't feed your population, whatever size it is, you're going to have starvation, famine situations, right? Okay. Um, we face a very interesting question here. Does anybody know globally how much food that is harvested is wasted, is never consumed? One third. Yeah, it's a lot. It's roughly 50%, which is very, very scary if you think about it. Half the food grown globally is never consumed. It's wasted. It's, it's, you know, I mean, you go to a supermarket here, you know, I mean, do, does this still happen in Japan? I mean, when I used to live in Tokyo, the, the secret was to go to the supermarket at about like 10 to 8 in the evening. <laughs> because of all the fresh fish, and so like this, yeah, they would discount, right? Because they couldn't sell it tomorrow. The sell by date was like today, right? And so there would be big discounts on, on the you know, the fresh stuff because it couldn't be recycled to tomorrow, right? Other stuff, of course, you can sell, you know, the, the sell by date or eat by date is usually there sometime in the future, okay? That this is incredible level of wastage, okay? Has to do with lots of factors, of course, including inadequate storage technology, lack of transportation, uh, all, all sorts of factors, but it's kind of a scandal, actually, if you think about it, that we waste half the food grown in the globe. If distributed properly, obviously there wouldn't really be any hunger, right? There'd be more than enough basically for everybody, okay? Uh, the environment, obviously, ecosystems, and the fact that human encroachment, particularly on ecosystems, of course, amongst its effects is loss of biodiversity. 
Now, there's a wonderful literature, for literary festival held in India every year, a place called Jaipur in, in Rajasthan, in, in Western India, which is kind of desert state, very beautiful city. Okay. And I went last year, and I went, one of the talks I went to was by a lady who just written a book called The History of Bees. Okay. And it's a very interesting novel. It's a novel. And one of the stories in the novel is actually set in China. Okay. It's about a period when bees have disappeared. And a huge percentage of the Chinese population, their job is simply pollinating by hand. You need a huge workforce. You know what I mean by this? You have to go with your little brush and you go from plant to plant and you have to pollinate because the bees used to do it for you. We had free pollination, all right? No bees, no pollination. So it's a very interesting novel. There, there, are, there are three stories woven together in the course of the, of the novel. One of the others is about actually North America where this phenomenon has occurred which biologists don't seem to understand, which is sudden bee death. You know, you have your hives of bees, they're fine. You go one day and the bees have just died. Nobody knows why. Is it parasites? Is it climate change or something? Is it they can't find adequate food supply? Okay, well, whatever, nobody seems to quite know. But something as simple as the bee could be the key to survival of civilization. A no bee future is not a good idea. Okay, and because of overuse of pesticides, for example, and certain kind of farming practices, okay, if you if you drive past lots of farms, they look lovely, green and beautiful, all right, but they don't have flowers. And bees don't eat wheat or barley or rice; they eat nectar from flowers, right? In fact, there is a concept which is called the green desert. So what looks like a very fertile farming area, it is, I mean, in terms of the crop growing, maybe, from point of view of bees, it's a really bad environment. There's nothing for them to eat, right? Unless people plant, and this has to do with, for example, expansion of farms where the hedgerows, in Europe, for example, farms used to be quite small. They had hedges. You had edges where there were flowers naturally growing, okay? But with intensive farming, often these are cleared to make large you know, open spaces that can be farmed with mechanized means. Okay? So think about the bee. Okay? So obviously loss of biodiversity is very dangerous, not only because you know, we're losing lovely animal species and so on, but because we don't know what the consequence is, potentially, of the loss of quite small species. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, is the desert, green desert is for just for human or for all creatures? For all creatures, basically. Many people who are writing and thinking about, about sustainability particularly are, are very much arguing that biodiversity of all creatures should be the model, not to decrease number of species, but to maintain them, whether plant or animal species, because of their role in the total ecosystem. Yeah, okay, and which we don't necessarily understand very well. And so biodiversity is a good thing, okay? So if you have a little garden, plant lots of different things in it, okay? Stuff for the bees to eat, stuff for the butterflies, stuff for your support, both um, vegetable and, and animal biodiversity. Energy, of course, society is moving towards extremely intensive energy use. One thing I always think about when I come to Japan is every time I pass a pachinko parlor, I wonder what their electricity bill is like. Huge number of lights, right? Brilliant light inside, outside, flashing sign. You know, somewhere I like, come here, you know, waste your money in my pachinko parlor, right? And down the road, there's another one, right? Okay, we, we are huge users of energy, okay? And when people talk about you know, how do I put it? We don't necessarily need more energy. What we probably need to do is save energy in the sense of more efficient use of energy resources that we already have. There's probably enough power around, but a lot of it is wasted in, I don't I mean, just mean blame pachinko parlors, right? But, you know, any number of places where huge amounts of uh, electricity is used. For example, you like these little stories, right? 
Everywhere you go in Japan, I'm sure we probably have one outside here, with you have the vending machine. You can get your hot drinks, your cold drinks, all right, <laughs> all right, this kind of stuff. The total number of vending machines in Japan collectively use the amount of electricity consumed in the whole of Bangladesh. Okay? The total electricity consumption in Bangladesh equals the amount of electricity consumed by vending machines in Japan. Scary thought, right? They're very useful because, you know, we could always get our, our drink out of a machine almost anywhere, even in the middle of the countryside, okay? But they use power, obviously. And even in the countryside, I've never seen one with a solar panel. Have you ever seen a vending machine with a solar panel? Maybe in the countryside, you put your little panel on top, it would keep your coffee and everything hot inside or cold. <laughs> I've never seen one, but there maybe there are somewhere, okay? Energy. Industry, the economy, of course, because many people would argue that the basis of a lot of the non-sustainability we have is the nature of our economy. It extracts resources, it pollutes, it creates waste, and it promotes consumption. And all of those are negative in terms of the long-term health of the planet, unless they're controlled, restricted in some way, all right? So that issue, and of course, urbanization, big cities. Um, and again, just, just to give you a little example of this, okay? Because I thought about this on Saturday, I went to Osaka. And the ride from here to Osaka is not exactly beautiful. It's totally urbanized from the moment you get on the train until you get off in Osaka, all right? There was, there's one major green area left in Delhi, city where I live, okay, at the moment. And it's, it's the tail end of, a, of a, a ridge of hills, low mountains, okay? So it's, it's kind of important. It, it creates, again, biodiversity in the city, a green space, and all this kind of stuff. Developers, of course, always looking at this thing, great, no, land, land, we could build on it. A developer, a hotel developer, came up with a proposal to build a hotel in that green space. All right, an environmental group challenged this in court. And when the case was heard in the court, the judge said, did something very interesting. He said, okay, he said, I, I will certainly review the pros and cons of this thing, but I want one piece of data from the developer, okay? How much water will a 200 bedroom hotel consume in one day? Now imagine this, just work this out yourself. I mean, in a sense, right? Imagine a 200 bed hotel, a room hotel. Most rooms would be occupied by probably more than one person. So at any point in time, there's say, it could be whole families, there could be three, 400 people in the hotel. Okay, assuming they all have a bath, they're all clean people, right? So at least one bath a day, you know, okay? Assuming they go to the toilet several, once or twice in the day at least, right? The water consumption turned out to far exceed the amount of groundwater that could be obtained by the hotel to meet that needs, which means water would have to be imported from other water sources just to meet the needs of one hotel. So I wasn't particularly thinking about sustainability on Saturday, I must admit, but you know, as you ride the train to Osaka, I think, how much water is used every day? in all those houses, those apartment blocks, those you know, dwelling places, hotels, factories, shops, right? The amount is incredible, it has to come from somewhere. Yeah. Okay, so urbanization, of course, intensifies these factors because it concentrates them. Both energy use, use of water and other resources, and of course, waste has to be disposed of somehow. So underneath the city, of course, there's this vast network of pipes, right, of water, sewerage, gas, electricity cables, now broadband, you know, whatever you have, it's, it's all down there underground somewhere, all right? Okay, so th those were the six core issues that they identified. And I think there are probably a few more as well. Um, let me... No, let me come back to this. Let me come back in a moment. Sorry, there's one more thing. Now, when, the, when that report was written, remember this is 1987, okay? 
It's quite interesting to go back and read it. You probably never will, but if you ever did. And it was fact preceded by another report. There was a Secretary General of the UN, a man called Scandinavian man called Dag Hammarskjöld. I don't know if you ever heard of him. He's tragically killed in an air crash, actually in the Congo. Nobody knows whether it's accidentally or not, but whatever happened, right? Um, there was a foundation named after him. So the Dag Hammarskjöld Foundation issued a report, I think, 1975. And if you read all of these reports, there are lots more. There's, there was the UN um, con uh, huge conference on sustainable development 2001. And there are all these COP meetings every, you know, the follow up. So there was the big climate meeting in Madrid a couple of months ago and so on, right? They all say the same thing. They all say, we have to do something now. The window of opportunity is like the next five years. So 1987, they were saying the same thing, all right? We're now 2020, all right? And I'm sure if somebody else writes a report next week, they'll say the same thing. We have to act now. You know, the window of opportunity is very small. If we don't act quickly, things are going to get worse, which they probably will, okay? But the scary thing is people have been saying this now for like 30, 40 years, and still nothing really major seems to have happened, except we're gonna talk next class about some sus approaches to sustainability. But behind this, they, they, if, you, if you were to read the report, you'll find they, they say there are a number of factors which frame those, those six major principles, and, and these are the main ones. Number one, the argument that democratic political systems are actually systems that promote sustainability. Okay. Citizens have a voice, you know, you can express your discontent with something, you can vote people out of office. Uh, I don't think it's happened in Japan, but in some parts of Europe, in Germany, for example, the Green Party is very strong, very strong. They have a lot of seats in the German parliament, okay? So, you know, I can vote, I can vote for a green, a green candidate, you know, I can express my opinion about environment this kind of way. The argument was that autocratic systems, this was still in 1987, okay. When did the Berlin Wall come down? Anybody know anything about that? Have you good at history? 1989, exactly, you're exactly right, 1989. So two years after the Brundtland Report, the Berlin Wall actually came down. In fact, the socialist regimes, particularly the ones in Eastern Europe, their ecological, uh, what do you call it, damage is far greater than most capitalist systems. Okay? Some of the most polluted places in the world were in the former East Germany. Okay? Um, Coal-fired power stations, you know, huge amounts of waste, uh, no pollution controls, no scrubbing of the smoke you know, the emissions and this kind of stuff, really bad, really bad. So, you know, those centralized systems on the whole, oddly enough, you'd have thought they would have maybe been more responsible than in fact not. You know, the, the old socialist states tended to be worse at uh, handling this up until maybe the 1990s. Now, I mean, China seems to be now making major steps towards renewables and so on, right? But old style socialist states weren't very good at this, okay? Secondly, of course, the key question, which we'll come back to, I'm sure, a number of times, is the economic system has to be compatible with sustainability. And the problem is, at the moment, we seem to have an economic system which is not compatible with sustainability. It extracts, it creates waste, it creates pollution, right? It damages the environment, cuts down forests, it does all sorts of things which are not very positive for the uh, future of the planet. So we have to rethink the nature of economics. Uh, this is a tricky question because, of course, it becomes immediately political, right? You know, you're anti-capitalist or you're anti-something. But we have, to, we have to definitely face that issue. We have to think about the nature of the economy. Nothing's really going to change if you keep going with the same kind of economic system, which is unsustainable. And it's the major institution probably driving you know, development processes. Technology. Now, again, there have been a lot of technological changes since 1987, right? 
And I certainly have taken part in conferences which were simply done through the internet. You can have video conferencing now. You don't have to get in a plane necessarily and travel, you know, hours to some meeting place and travel back again and after like two days, you know, you can talk to each other without leaving your your own space on a lovely screen. Um, which is simply an example of a kind of technology which is helpful in contributing. Now, you could argue, of course, that there are technologies which are negative to some of, some of these, these things, okay? Um, if you, if you the, again, it's controversial about the date at which we pass the point of what is called peak oil. Do you know that phrase, peak, peak oil? We may have already passed it. The concept of peak oil is the, is the idea, you know, it looks like a peak, like a mountain peak. You know, we, we, we extract, we extract, we extract. Then one day we reach a point at which it becomes less and less economical to extract oil. All right? Or, and this relates to, again, very much the technology. Canada in Alberta, in the western part of Canada, there are huge tar sands. Tar sands are ge geological formations which contain oil, not in liquid form, but embedded in the, you know, if you see the, the road being tarmacked, you know, the road is being resurfaced, that hot black stuff which is spread on the road, right? All the road, the roads out here, every, everywhere has it, okay? Those tar fields contain very large potentially at least contain very large quantities of oil, okay? But it's not in liquid form. How do you get it out? Just dissolved by heat. Yes, exactly. And how much energy does that use, <laughs> right? Okay, basically to get the oil out, you have to pump in superheated water. You have to dissolve it, pump it out in a liquid form, and then separate the oil from from the, the, the water, basically, that you've been pumping in. So you need huge quantities of water, which is then very polluted, okay, because it's mixed with, with, with oils and all sorts of stuff, right? And you need huge amounts of energy. If you actually do an energy audit, something very interesting appears. You might, in fact, be using the same amount of energy to get the oil out as you get from the oil when you consume it. Think, this is stupid, right? There's zero positive you know, net gain in terms of energy, as, and you've created a lot of environmental destruction, all right, and created huge quantities of polluted water, okay? Which, if you want to purify it, to reuse it, itself requires energy to repurify the water to be put back in to the next round of extracting the oil, so, right? Technology can go both ways. Trade and finance systems, obviously. Um, I, I was just reading about an interesting example of this in Mozambique in Africa, Southern Africa. Very, very innovative. Maybe, I, maybe we talk about it next week. So There's a very innovative program of what is called agroecology. Agroecology is promoting ecologically sound farming, not using chemical inputs, minimizing use of pesticides, you know, using da, 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 da. Quite a big pilot study that involved a whole group of villages in Mozambique, okay? The people who initiated this program couldn't get money from any of the major aid donors. So, oh, no, we don't, we don't sponsor that kind of stuff. It's, it's not, it's just small farmers, peasants, you know, who wants to put money into this kind of stuff? We want big projects. You want a power station, right? You want an you air, air field, you know, airport, something? Fine, you know, but peasant farmers, not, not interested. Huge trouble. In fact, they persisted, and in fact, it, in the end, they, they found finance from other, other private um, philanthropists and people who were prepared to risk giving them money, and this kind of stuff. So to look at the whole system of trade and finance and the way in which trade is organized through organizations like the World Trade Organization and whether it in fact genuinely benefits smaller or poorer countries that are trying to enter markets, okay? Because every time you hear Mr. Trump, 
The word Mr. Trump seems to love very much is tariffs, right? You're going to import tariffs on people. You're going to make it expensive to import from China. You're going to buy tariffs on stuff in the belief that it actually helps the American economy, though it does not. That's another economic story, but we won't get into that, okay? But it may be that the whole international trading system is not really compatible with long-term sustainable development of anybody, including uh, particularly poorer countries. Another little story. The European Union used to import, sounds very minor, okay, but it gives a very good illustration. It used to import most of its bananas from the West Indies, from the Caribbean, okay? The reason for this was that many of the European powers had long-term historical interests. They colonized the Caribbean. Countries like Bermuda or Trinidad or something like this were colonized by the British. Uh, other parts, uh, uh, Haiti and so on, was colonized by the French. Dominican Republic is so on, colonized by the Spanish, okay? They thought they had like a, a moral responsibility to buy your bananas from the Caribbean, okay? The US brought a suit against the European Union in the World Trade Organization claiming this was discriminatory because the US has huge agricultural operations in Central America, okay, south of, of Mexico, where they grow bananas, okay? Said, so it's not fair that you should buy bananas from the Caribbean, but not buy bananas from American companies in Central uh, America. Okay, and in fact, the, the, world, the, the World Trade Organization upheld the American case, saying, well, yeah, it was discriminatory in the sense that they were specifically selecting to buy from only certain places. Okay, and if, if American companies could offer cheaper bananas, you should buy from the US companies. Okay, now, is this ethical? I say, well, why, why shouldn't you try to repay, in a sense, your historical debt by trading with, with your country, right? I buy your bananas. I don't want these American bananas, right? I want, I, want, I want bananas from Jamaica or Trinidad or wherever, Antigua or something, but I, I, don't, I, don't, want, I don't want to buy American, American bananas. American bananas. The companies are American, okay? But the World Trade Organization rules had to argue this was discriminatory. Okay, and, and wanted to ban the selective buying of bananas from the Caribbean. So European countries, in other words, were more or less forced to begin to buy bananas from US companies operating in Central America. Mm, all sorts of issues here, right? Including ethical issues and historical issues. Should you try to redo some of the damage? And some of that damage was quite serious in the sense that it also involved the slave trade Right? I mean, the labor that was used on these plantations were slaves. These were, not, these were not free workers. So, you know, the big historical issues tied up with this, right? The international system, where we talked about the World Trade Organization, is one of the great examples of multilateral uh, institutions. And the international system would include, obviously, things like the UN, okay, World Bank. The IMF, International, Mon uh, you know, International Monetary Fund, uh, World Trade Organization, and the regional banks, the Asian Development Bank, for example, which is actually in Manila. But the head of the Asian Development Bank is always Japanese. Isn't that interesting? Okay, although the bank physically is in the headquarters in Manila. They do have a big institute in, in Tokyo, right? And how that international system, is it functional? to solving these new kind of problems. Some people would argue that it's really not, even the UN. When was the UN founded? By many countries from... Uh, yeah, what, what year? Um, 1945. 1945, immediately after the war. Who are the five permanent members of the Security Council that have the veto? That is to say, they can, they can stop decisions made by other parts of the UN system. China. Who are the five members of the... <laughs> China, UK, China, UK, Russia, France, and the US. Now, at least, at least 
two of those countries, UK and France, probably don't have much claim. Japan is not a permanent member. Brazil, which is the biggest society in South America, is not in. There's no African country, all right? People say Nigeria, possibly Ghana, certainly South Africa probably ought to have a seat on the... The, the, the members of the Security Council rotate. The five permanent members are always there. The other countries take it in turn. So Japan, of course, has sat on the Security Council. But if Japan makes a decision and the Russians don't like it, for example, they can veto it. So it cannot, it cannot be passed. Okay? We say this is not functional anymore. You know, the world's changed so much since 1945. Uh, that you know, th th this this is this is an ancient system which <laughs> worked maybe in the 1950s, even 1960s, but doesn't really work anymore. Do you know who the five biggest arms traders are in the world? The, the people selling the largest number of weapons on the world market. <laughs> They're the five members permanent members of the Security Council. So there's another weird thing going on here. You know, the people who are supposed to be promoting world peace and so on are also countries which are busily selling weapons to everybody else. Okay, so maybe we come back to this. Flexible systems of administration enable, you know, the international bureaucracies, for example, able to, to um, rethink their position in terms of the new issues that are emerging, things like, like climate change. And of course, a more holistic picture of sustainability. It's not just ecological or economic. It obviously includes some of those things, questions of poverty, right? resource use and access to resources, uh, migration, huge number of people moving around the world these days, right? Gender questions, social inequality, health, obviously, and something which, if you live in India, you definitely think about a lot, which is corruption. It's estimated that a very high percentage of all aid budgets that circulate in the world, you know, an aid organization gives, you know, $5 million to do something, a very high percentage is, how do you put it politely? We to, in English, you sometimes say it's milked. You know, it disappears into the pockets of administrators or bureaucrats or of people in the government and so on. It never reaches the people that the aid was supposed to, or at least some of it does. But a very, a much smaller percentage reaches the people who were supposed to be helped. The rest disappears somewhere. Or it disappears in so-called administrative costs. Okay. Um, that is true. And of course, issues of health, which are very much tied up with these things. So the, the, the six areas that the Burnt Land Report identified, they kind of expanded to include these dimensions. All right. And I think you can see they are all very important. If you want to maintain, to attain any kind of sustainability, you'd have to, you'd have to take, you'd have to pay attention to some of these things as well. Now, the classical definition, the Burnt Land one, has been much discussed, obviously, and say there, there are other definitions. But amongst the issues that have come up, I think, are these six. The first is a very big one. Many people have said that sustainability and development are not compatible. If you have development, you're, you're not going to have a sustainable future. All right? Oh, that's a very tricky question. You know, if you're going to develop, developing countries want more, more roads, more railways, more power stations, more fuel, more energy, more better hospitals, better, da, 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 right? Their, their levels of consumption are going to rise and rise, right? And there's not much sign that consumption is dropping in the wealthy countries, right? Except in, say, in, in the case of Japan, it may be it may drop because of the decline of population not because everybody suddenly decided not to consume so much. Okay, get up tomorrow morning and think, I'm gonna have a simple life, right? I'm gonna only travel by bicycle from now on, I'm not gonna take the train, you know, I'm not gonna fly, I'm not gonna do any of these things, right? Uh, I'm gonna stay out of convenience stores, I'm gonna do all this kind of stuff, right? I don't think many people make that lifestyle 
kind of decision. Some people do, but not a majority. So this is a very major question. And it raises a very interesting question for us to think about. I mean, in the class here, or all of us think about, which is, what would sustainable development look like? How do you, in fact, meet the needs, social needs, for example, say poverty alleviation, without causing more damage to environment, extracting more non-renewable resources, and those kinds of things. That's a very big challenge, a very interesting one. What kind of thinking, this is very exciting by the way, this is really future thinking, okay? To think about what, what kind of future can we envisage that does not in the same time destroy the very planet that we're living on, which looks like the outcome of the current patterns of development. So that's the big question. And people said, well, Okay, the Brundtland Report still assumed that you could have both. You could protect the environment and you could have development. And lots of concepts have emerged since then to try to bring those things together, such as the notion of green growth. Ever heard that phrase? Green growth. Beware. Uh, I remember going into a convenience store, I think somewhere in Tokyo, and there was someone called the Green Corner. I thought, oh, this is good. They must be selling organic stuff, all right? It wasn't at all. They were selling cigarettes and all sorts of stuff. Right? I thought, why is this the Green Corner? If there's a phrase, this is sometimes called greenwashing. You know, when you want to cover up something, it's called whitewashing. You know, I, I cover up and then no, nobody can see what's there. This is called greenwashing, right? If you see adverts, by major oil companies in the next few days or weeks, read them carefully. They're almost always greenwashing. BP, you know, has produced clean, beautiful energy. BP was the oil company that several years ago, their deep drilling rig in the Caribbean ruptured. Did you read about this? You know, and there was this uncontrollable, they were drilling, drilling in very, very deep water, right? Uh, I, what was it called? What was the, the, the platform called? Hundreds of thousands of gallons, of course, of crude oil were released into the Caribbean. And, you know, they couldn't cap the well for day, weeks and weeks. They were trying to do some, some way to solve this. You know, the technology was basically beyond them. They had a fallback method to cap the well. It didn't work. Okay. And, you know, a huge amount of damage was done to, to uh, you know, seabirds, fish, coastal communities, you know, fishing communities, tourist industry in Florida and places like this on those kind of areas, severely damaged by this. But read their adverts. They're almost always greenwashing, how clean, beautiful, sustainable our energy is, right? So think carefully when you read those kind of ads, all right? Um, that's maybe the, the big question. But then the second thing is that some people have raised the question about can we know the needs of future generations? So you would say, well, not exactly, but you do assume that they would want enough food, enough shelter, enough basic resources, right? Okay. The other things maybe we don't know. Culturally, we don't necessarily know what kind of lifestyle they would want. Okay. But that's, that's for them to think about, not for us to worry about. So we can't know in detail, but we can presumably assume they would want a clean environment they would want basic resources. They would want food security. They would want those kinds of things. So current policy should always assume that we know at least that. Okay. The third thing is, I know we keep coming back to this, that in the Brundtland Report, there's no discussion at all of social or cultural sustainability. Okay. That can mean a number of things. And it's kind of interesting if you, well, I think we can see different, slightly different ways of thinking about cultural and social sustainability. We suggested a little bit, and we're going to come back to this. In, in post disaster situations, almost always one of the keys to resilience after a disaster is the cohesion of the community. If the community can cooperate, stay together, good things happen quickly. Psychologically, it's better for people. It's more effective in rebuilding and uh, making decisions and all this kind of stuff, okay? Um, 
Some sociologists certainly argue that the tendency in modern society, as societies modernize is for societies to fragment into smaller and smaller units. Okay. Now, again, I can't give you the exact figures, but the number of elderly single people living alone in Japan is very high and likely to increase because of the aging of the society. So the tendency for people to live in extended families where elders live with their younger people, you know, the rest of you have two, three generations living in the same house, this is disappearing. And the way in which real estate companies build apartments, they're not designed for extended families. They're designed for nuclear families, right? Age of marriage is getting later. Family size is dropping. So if you're projecting all this into the future, what kind of society do you imagine? Number one. And number two, would it be resilient in the face of future stresses? Who do you, who do you, what is your social network? Who do you know? Where are your friends? Where are your family? Do you have any except on your Facebook, right? Okay, and those friends are not necessarily very useful in an emergency. I have lots of friends, right? <laughs> I post my stuff on YouTube, I get lots of likes, <laughs> right? It doesn't necessarily mean anything in an emergency, right? They're kind of virtual friends rather than people who actually provide you with physical and psychological support in the event of, say, a disaster, or it doesn't have to be a major disaster. It can be any kind of social pressure situation, okay? So it seems to me this, this is very important that we should bring this back into our model Okay. When we look at case study, more case studies, I think we'll see this is almost always a key component is the community. Right? More atomized, more separated communities don't have the power to come together around mutual aid, mutual support, or anything like the degree they probably used to in, in the past in most societies. Okay? So that, that's missing, certainly from the Brundtland report. The fourth thing is whether that definition of you know, meeting the needs of the present while keeping resources for you know, future generations is not really critical enough. Um, and there are just three examples. Maybe you can think of some more. Okay. Again, we have to face this question of whether our economic system is actually at the basis of non-sustainability. If it is, we have to change it, right? And that's a really big political issue, okay? How are you gonna change the nature of our economy in ways that it becomes, it promotes sustainability rather than destroying the resources and environment that it relies on, okay? So you don't have to be a Marxist necessarily. It might help if you were to criticize capitalism itself as being a model which is inherently non-sustainable. You can't have sustainable capitalism. It's a promotion, it, it's, a, it's a system which promotes consumption and greed, basically, right? And that doesn't work in the, in the very, certainly in the very long run, okay? So we, we, we discussed that. Secondly, one of the biggest sources of environmental damage and pollution in the world is the military. I mean, collectively, the militaries of, of various countries, okay? Um, there are other factors there too. Um, there, is a, there is a concept of what is called the peace dividend. Now, I don't know what percentage of national budget is spent on the military, on the self-defense forces in Japan. Does anybody know? 5% of GDP or? In India, it's a lot. Yeah? It's well over 5% of GDP is spent on the military. Uh, and, you know, again, this is partly based in historical conflicts. Uh, India had a conflict with China at one point over the border. Okay, it has an ongoing conflict with Pakistan, okay, which is often quite violent. I mean, people get killed on a regular basis along the borderline, this kind of stuff. Military, the militaries collectively of the world, First of all, they're huge polluters, okay? They burn enormous quantities of fuel. 
often even in peacetime, I mean, you have practice, right? You have to train, you drive around your tank, right? You fly around your airplane, you do all this kind of stuff. You're not really going anywhere, but you're burning fuel, all right? And of course, uh, weapons training, if people are actually using live weapons, cause huge amounts of, of ecological damage. You know, stuff that enters the... As a kid, I lived near an area which during the war had been used as a military training area. And now what, more than 70 years later, you still can't go in there because it's littered with toxic substances. You know, people are experimenting with poison gas, people are experimenting with kinds of explosives and all sorts of stuff. So probably it's uninhabitable for hundreds of years, okay? So far from the world getting more peaceful, in many ways it's getting more militarized. Budgets on, on weapons and, and the military tend to expand in many countries. They're getting bigger and bigger, okay? Uh, and the peace dividend simply refers to the idea that if the budgets which were currently spent on militarization were spent on peace, you could solve most of our development problems, right? Schools, you want hospitals, you want better whatever, okay? Uh, most of this is being wasted on armies and navies and air forces, which don't do anything. Fortunately, unless there's really a war, right? They're actually using resources which are wasted, right? A very odd. If you ran a business like that, you'd go bankrupt very quickly, right? You know, you spend all your time burning resources, but there's no profit, <laughs> right? Okay. Um, and maybe even globalization itself. The, the, um, again, you can, you, can, um, you, can, you, can do this, you can do this at home, do a little bit of food. Just for example, that there are two well-known concepts, all right? The carbon footprint. And food miles. Carbon footprint is, is, you can do it as an individual, you can also do it if you take a community, a city, for example, and try to figure out what, what the contribution to, say, global warming is of an urban settlement in terms of generation of heat, use of energy, uh, waste, you know, downstream pollution, air pollution, for example, as a result of industry and this kind of stuff. You can do it very simply with food miles. And I still, when I, when I, I lived in, when I was in Tokyo, that this example I still remember. I, I tend, if I have nothing else to read, I read the cereal packet. Do you do this, you know, you're reading your cornflakes or your whatever. And I happened to be re reading my, my cereal packet one day, right? And it was this substance called muesli. You know, there's a kind of cereal that's made of oats and nuts and raisins and sometimes dates and whatever. I think it originated in Switzerland, but now you find it everywhere. You can buy it in any supermarket here. You can buy packets of muesli. And I started reading the packet, and I suddenly thought, this is very interesting. I'm sitting in Tokyo, right? I'm eating a cereal that was imported from Europe, okay? Most of the ingredients, I think, I think the, the, the packaging company, the cereal company was based, oh, let's say in London, but I don't remember where it was, right? But many of the ingredients, like the oats you could grow in England, um, nuts and raisins you can't, it's too cold. They must have come from Southern Europe or North Africa. So I, I just did a little calculation and I calculated that roughly my breakfast had traveled 6,000 miles. Okay. Now you start to think about it. You think, ah, uh, maybe I could have eaten a breakfast that had traveled like five miles, <laughs> right? So no transportation costs if you're buying from a local farmer, right? You know, you're buying from the local, local market. The stuff is grown locally. It's, it's, it's distance that it's actually literally traveled, transported, would be small. The use of energy would have been small, carbon footprint would have been small, right? Uh, all sorts of intermediate processes would have been cut out completely because you were eating locally, okay? You can, you, say, you can try this anytime. Next time you eat or drink something, read the packet and figure out where did it come from? You know, and actually how many miles did it travel before it actually got to you? Like coffee, 
definitely is not grown in Japan, right? You grow coffee in Brazil, possibly. India grows quite good coffee. Where, would, where did your coffee come from? Does it tell you the source of the origin of your? You could probably work it out, though, if you, if you, if you tried. You know? So yeah, I mean, I'm drinking coffee here. But in fact, coffee you know, originated the other side of the world. <laughs> You know, not that we don't want to consume these things. Trade can be good for you know, linking people to one another. But it's worth thinking about the kind of ecological costs, particularly, and energy usage of transportation of foodstuffs. One aspect of globalization is, I mean, I'm sure in Kyoto, definitely in Osaka, right? If I want to eat Italian food, I could eat Italian food. I could eat Chinese food. I could eat French food. I could probably eat anything. Right, because our diets have become increasingly globalized. Right, Thai food, you know, Vietnamese food, you know, whatever you can find it somewhere around here. Right, you can always find these things. Right, which is nice, except we often don't think about what is behind it, in terms of the long-term consequences of the the so-called externalities of what we are consuming may be very big. So think about that when you're consuming anything. Right. One of the questions that's related to this is a very interesting question about why do we consume so much? And sociologists have talked about this as well. And the answer is, of course, there are several. I mean, you need to consume something to, to, to live, right? OK. But of course, a lot of it has to do with things like status, you know, how important I am, letting you know how much I consume. My car is bigger than your car. You know, my house is bigger than your house, right? And you know, I, I eat in very expensive restaurants, and you can't afford to eat there, so my status is higher than you, right? There's a lot of this competitive nature to consumption as well, OK? And he's not much read these days. When I was a student, he was very popular. There was, um, I think he was German originally, but lived in the US, of a social theorist called Herbert Marcuse. His name is there. You can still find his books around, I'm sure. Who argued that one of the keys to sustainability, although when he was writing, people didn't use that word very much, was what he called the education of desire. Okay? And he and other people have talked about lots of lots of examples of this. And um, just to take one very simple one, and it occurred to me recently, because I'm living in the same environment. When I was a graduate student, I lived in a hostel for graduate students. OK? And we all had nice little apartments, which had their own little kitchen, their own little bathroom. OK? Were very ecologically efficient. They had underfloor heating, which was a brilliant idea. Because you know heat rises? Often in Japan, you find the heater is up under the, up here. So if you stand up, you're warm, right? But if you're sitting down, you're quite cold, because the, the heat doesn't circulate from it, right? So very, very nice, this guy. But one of the interesting things was that we had communal place for washing machines and cleaning equipment, like vacuum cleaners, OK? The argument was a very simple one, was that, I mean, how many times a week, unless you have a big family, do you use your washing machine? Probably once, twice a week. No? If you're a big family, lots of babies or something, you probably use it all the time, right? If you're, if you're an adult, if you're like a single adult, you probably use it once a week or something, twice a week maybe. But you buy this big machine, it sits there using space in your apartment, right? You hardly ever use it. Say, maybe same with the vacuum cleaner and so on. So why not share them? then 20 people can share a vacuum cleaner because you only need it for short periods of time. Then you can just return it. So where I'm living in the Shugakuen International House, we have the same system. We have, we have a little laundrette downstairs. And at the end of each hallway, we have uh, two or three vacuum cleaners you can borrow and sweeping stuff to clean out your apartment. You don't have to own it yourself. So consumption level drops tremendously. Now, the economy doesn't like this because, of course, People can't sell you so much stuff. But in other respects, it makes very good sense. We can share resources. 
without necessarily all of us having to have a car, a vacuum cleaner, a washing machine, or whatever, because we don't actually use those things. I, had a, I have a friend in Munich in Germany who is an artist, and she's a member of a kind of commune. They don't all live together, but they share resources like the car. They have one car, which they share. So if I want the car to, this morning, I sign up for it, maybe yesterday. You know, say, can I, have the, I need the car between 9 and 11, okay? And you want the car from 11 to 1 or something. You know, I will return it on time. And they have rules about, of course, filling up the fuel so that you're not exploiting other people and this kind of stuff. And say, it's fantastic because you have one car shared between about six people. And almost always it works. Sometimes there's a clash. You know, I want it and you want it at the same time. We have to choose. Somebody has to choose between who gets it, who takes the bus today, okay? Um, so his idea of the education of desire was that if you can understand why people want to consume and head them away from the kind of more negative or selfish forms of consumption, then you can a huge drop in the amount of stuff which is being, of resources which is being taken out of the environment because it's a sharing economy basically. But that requires a kind of psychological shift. You know, it's not my car, right? It's a shared one. It's not my thing, right? And you have to get used. As students, we're mostly used to that idea. But as soon as you kind of get your own place, you want all this stuff for yourself, right? Why not maintain that same kind of sharing economy, uh, at least in principle? So it's a very interesting idea. And the other thing which we are going to talk about, of course, is we can talk about sustainability, we can come up with great definitions, we can do all sorts of stuff, how do we get there, right? The next question is, how do we get from here to that desired state? Now, originally in the Brundtland report, there's not much in the way of concrete policy recommendations, but we're gonna look at some. Okay, so we got, do I have any more slides? Did I have it? I think that maybe is the last one, did I? Oh yes, no oh, it is, oh yes. Oh, here are some of them. Okay. Um, one of the ones we're going to look at, and you can, you can Google this very easily, what are called transition theories. Anybody heard that phrase? Transition theory. It started as a movement in a little town in the west of England. Okay. Quite a small town. And the local citizens, led by one particular young gentleman, he's not so young now, he was young then, came up with this idea that peak oil is going to happen sooner or later. It's a finite resource, right? You can't make oil. It takes how many million years or something to produce oil, right? You can't make it, okay? There are dangerous alternatives like nuclear power, okay? But... And, uh, you know, the people often say the trouble with renewables is they don't generate enough power. That's not true if we reduce our power consumption. So the idea of this transition movement began with the idea with that one small town, how can you plan for what they called energy descent? To begin to reduce use of energy, to begin to reduce food miles, to reduce the carbon footprint of the total community, okay? Efficient public transport rather than private car, uh, good bicycle parks or bicycle paths that people can use so that they're not competing with motorized traffic. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about this in detail later. It's a very, very interesting, you can Google transition, their, their stuff is all free online. It's all open source stuff. So you wanna find their manuals on, how to do this with your community, it's, it's all out there. You know? um, so the idea was we need to start planning now for a future which is definitely going to arrive. But we talked about technology just now. I mean, if, you, if you're a long-term thinker, would you invest in shares in an airline at the moment? You know, or, or oil prices going to rise and rise and, you know, within relatively short period of time, 20, 30 years, we're going to find that air traffic has become a luxury. It's not a really viable way of long distance transport because fuel prices, unless some other alternative fuel is discovered or can be utilized, 
flying around like crazy is going to just not be a, a future option for, for most people, right? Okay, so transition theory is one, one example. This we definitely need to think about how we get there, right? We're, now we are here, we have all these problems. How do we plan for a future which looks much more sustainable than the one we have, okay? Um, there's a very best-selling book by an American anthropologist called Jared Diamond. Um, the book is called Collapse. Okay, I'm sure there's Japanese trans, you know, translations, Chinese translation by now. It's a best-selling book, available in cheap paperback edition, Penguin Books. You see those little paperback books called Penguin? Thousands of titles in, in simple um, paperback format. Okay. In, in that book, what he's done is he's looked at a whole range of civilizations which have passed away, okay, uh, in different geographical locations in Central America, the Aztec and Inca civilizations, in Greenland, in Easter Island, the famous island in the Pacific that has these great statues. You've seen pictures of these huge, like gigantic faces, yeah, okay. It's now a treeless island. Okay, he takes lots of examples. Okay, his basic argument is that in every case he examines, the basis for a civilization collapsing was that it destroyed its an ecological base. It destroyed itself. Okay, cut down all the trees. It it you know damaged the environment to the extent they could no longer support the population. You know, so famine and so on began to occur. And of course, the moral of the book, the story, what he's talking about really, is that we're doing the same thing. And as he points out in, in the various case studies, it's really worth reading, it's a, it's a very readable book, okay? Is that in almost every case, people knew what they were doing, but they didn't change direction. There's another useful concept there, right? Which is, you may know, is what is called, Path dependency. Yeah, path dependency is the idea you're on a track, you realize it's going in the wrong direction, but you don't change. You keep going, and as I say, what his argument is basically that there have been a lot of civilizations who've done exactly that. They knew they were creating trouble for themselves, but they didn't stop. They kept going until, of course, finally they collapsed. Why are these great civilizations not there anymore? Right? And it's not lack of knowledge. That issue we raised last week, remember? That strange gap between knowledge and behavior. I know this doesn't work, but I don't change my, my behavior as a result, right? This is, this is path dependency, basically, right? Crucial role of the economy, which has obvious impact on the environment. We, we know that, right? Okay. Um, but it has sociological consequences as well, and cultural ones. It has sociological ones like patterns of social inequality. Who gets the goodies? Where, where, where are the divisions between you know, people who are benefiting from an economy and people who are laboring in that economy with very little uh, real benefit from it? You know, they're living in an affluent society. They're not affluent, right? They're excluded in many ways from the uh, the benefits of, of what may be a, a, a very successful economy, but it doesn't reach them. And what are technically called subjectivities? Now, what subjectivities mean is, let's just take a simple example to illustrate it, is entertainment. How, how many of you make your own entertainment? Do you go home in the evening and tell stories to each other? You paint pictures to yourself to hang on your wall? I need a good book to write, read, so I write my own book because it's bound to be better than ever. I don't think most of us do this. What we do is we consume ready-made culture, right? If I want to be entertained, I turn on the TV, right? I, I, go, to the, I go to the movies. I, 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 you know, I, I buy a subscription to Netflix, right? Or I go to YouTube or somewhere. We don't make this, right? But of course, it has profound effects on the way in which we see the world. You know, ideas about relationships, idea about fashion, idea about all sorts of things we're usually getting from 
those manufactured sources. They're telling us what we should eat, what we should think, what we should drive, you know, what we should smoke, what we should do something, right? And if we're not careful, we believe them, right? right? So our subjectivities, our inner life, as it were, is profoundly affected by the nature of our economy, right? It's trying to persuade us to consume certain things, behave in certain ways, play certain sports, go to certain places, you know, da 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 da, whatever, all those stuff. And we're not making any of it, all right? We're getting it secondhand. Have you ever thought about that? Quite dangerous in a way, right? Our entertainment, our leisure time is also colonized by our economy, okay? Uh, the question of whether our political leadership and the nature of our political culture is adequate to responding to these global problems. Now, if you, if you start to criticize democracy, people think, oh, you're some terrible fascist, you know? But democratic societies have, most, have recently elected Mr. Donald Trump, in the United States. They've elected Mr. Mori in India, who's an extreme right-wing character. They've, ex they've elected an extreme right-wing president in Brazil, okay? Um, a lot of Eastern Europe has the same thing. Governments are now very, very right-wing. And right-wing in this context usually means they are pro-business, anti-environmentalism. They do not want to make these kind of changes. Okay, they want to protect uh, Mr. Trump, for example, is quite openly said he wants to protect the American coal industry, even though there's obviously plenty of evidence that coal, you know, the coal industry, particularly burning coal as a generating energy is highly polluting. That doesn't matter. You know, you're going to protect American jobs. Okay, have we protected? Okay. So whether, whether this, in fact, whether the whole political culture, for example, Again, we'd have to do some imaginative thinking here. When are general, elect, general elections in Japan or every, is it four years or five years? Between a, a general election. When's the next general election, national? Is it five years or four years between elections? Some countries is four, some it's five, okay. But say that's fine, because you can call people, make people accountable. They don't have too long to settle into being corrupt and this kind of stuff. The trouble is that politicians tend to think in the short term, right? I want to get reelected, right? And so I'm not going to start pushing radical sounding theories. And in fact, watch what's happening in the United States at the moment. The front running Democrat candidate at the moment, it's only the beginning of the process, this is Mr. Bernie Sanders, who describes himself as a socialist. And a lot of people said that will make him unelectable in the United States. They will not respond. The electorate will not respond to someone who wants to nationalize industries, who wants to. He's got lots of good ideas, for example, like making education free, you know, and raising taxes on the rich and this kind of stuff. They're all great policies, but people probably won't elect him. You know, because he's got a longer term view than just. You know, I think in the U.S. it's four years, right? It's four years between presidential elections, right? It's too short. So how do you overcome that problem of, of a political culture which is linked basically to the short term when the big problems are long term? Okay, there's a mismatch. They don't fit together very well. Um, the big question of prevention before and restoration afterwards, I mean, not only in disaster situations, but in, in lots of contexts, okay? Um, I was involved in a project that was working in slum communities in Latin America at one time. And this, this is very interesting. Slum communities are highly vulnerable to natural disasters, floods, earthquake, anything like this, because of the quality of building, um, people building on dangerous slopes, you know, the people doing all the wrong things. But they're poor, okay? So you know, you don't say blame them. What you probably want to think about is ways you can give advice to those kind of, not move out of the slum, and definitely don't tear the slum down, OK? 
okay, which is a common practice. You know, the government doesn't like slums, so you destroy the slum. Where does everybody go? Okay, the, the answer is they probably move to another slum, or the slums get bigger because they move further out from the city center. Okay, if you give simple advice to people on housing which is resistant to natural natural disasters and it can be done quite simply okay in many cases work work which some of my colleagues did in southeast asia which is a different kind of climate vietnam for example where um, cyclones typhoons occur was how to reinforce your house very simply how to structure the roof in such a way that it won't it won't tear off quite simple and quite cheap methods can be used to prevent problems happening in the first place. And in doing so, you increase the, uh, all sorts of things. I lived in a slum in a city called Bandung, which is in Indonesia at one time. And this was a very, very interesting experience for lots of reasons. So I won't bore you with all the stories about my, my slum life, okay? The first thing was the slum had uh, its own political structure. It was like going through immigration. When I moved into the slum, one of the first things I had to do was go and meet the head man. And he had a book. He had like an exercise book that he obviously bought from some little shop, in which he, he took my passport, he wrote down the number, and this kind of stuff. You know, just like I'd arrived in another country, right? Like he was the immigration officer. So you know, you're now a member of the slum community, right? The streets outside the slum were quite dangerous. Um, petty crime, mugging, um, your bag snatching, um, crowded buses were very dangerous places to travel, okay? Uh, inside the slum, there was no crime. There was no crime, okay? Once you left the slum, now most people would think, oh goodness, I'm going to a slum, you know, this is a really dangerous place. Little tiny alleyways, self-constructed housing, all mixed up with one another. They stole most of their electricity by simply, you know, taking cables to the public electricity system and, you know, borrowing, <laughs> right? <laughs> Never paid any electricity bills, right? This kind of stuff. You thought it'd be a really dangerous place. It was not at all. The slum had a social structure. Okay, and that social structure was one of essentially mutual responsibility amongst the slum dwellers. So it turned out that in quite simple ways, you could in fact make a, apparently a slum, which is a negative term anyway, right? Some people started calling them informal settlements. That sounds much better than slum. I don't live in a slum, I live in an informal settlement. Same thing, but you change the name, it sounds much better. Okay, all right, all right. Um, the probability of disaster or of the of negative impact of disaster is very much smaller. Plus, as I say, one of the key things was the promotion of this sense of community in which people were mutually responsible. Therefore, the space was safe. And in the event of any kind of accident or whatever, people actually did help each other because they knew their neighbors. You know, they were, you were intimately connected with the whole community. And uh, this had many, many positive outcomes. So this, this relates to what we're going to talk about next class, to begin to explore some alternative models to the current economic social system, right? Um, there are many, there are many. We can't talk about all of them, you know, but we can, we can take a little selection and you can perhaps go hunt for some more, okay? They deal with these different levels. I mean, some are, some are social, um, promoting community cohesion, okay? Um, some are economic, changing the nature of the economy or promoting economy within communities such that the economy itself promotes social cohesion. There's a term for this, we'll talk about this next, next week, it's sometimes called solidarity economy, okay? Where people are engaged in mutual uh, uh, economic relationships, sometimes through barter. They're not using money at all, right? You know, you have the bananas, I have the coconuts. Well, we, we work out an exchange rate, okay? So for, you know, such a bunch of bananas, you get so many coconuts, whatever, money, money doesn't come into the situation at all. 
Yeah. Um, in fact, that is actually an interesting example, by the way, the so-called alternative currencies, where communities inventing their own money, which is acceptable within the community and has nothing to do with the national currency outside. Okay. Um, of course, there are architectural experiments, um, ecological ones. I mean, there, there are lots, and they're really fun because what they alert us to is whereas when we looked at case studies of disasters, you learn certain lessons from the disaster. This is looking at it from the other side. What bright ideas have people come up with that can address the question of creating sustainability? Okay. They're fun and, and extremely interesting. I think you'll find them extremely interesting. And we'll, we'll look at as many as we can think of. I mean, I have thousands of examples out there. One of the nice things about living in India, actually, is there are lots and lots and lots of people experimenting with all sorts of things, in relation to water, in relation to urban development, in relation to any number of desertification, uh, any, any number of issues like this, OK? Uh, one of the questions that always arises when we talk about these alternatives, is the problem of what people call scaling up. Do you know that concept? Another concept for today, scaling up. Scaling up means that if you have a fairly small scale and quite successful project, you know, I've created my urban farm, let's say, OK, um, how do you take that small scale experiment and expand it into a social wide thing? Sometimes that's difficult to do. Sometimes it's not so difficult. Sometimes it's simply to do with a kind of lack of imagination. Yeah. Um, I remember arguing with my, my, my boss at the UN one time, our building in Tokyo, if you ever go see it, you're always welcome to visit. The UN building in Tokyo is a horrible architecture. It looks like this. OK. And the kind of front door is down here, somewhere like this. OK, it has all these, these flat spaces. OK. Now, there were a number of things wrong with this design, in my view, right? But too late. I wasn't consulted whether the architect designed the building, right? OK. Number one, it wastes a huge amount of space. The internal space is a, is a big atrium, in fact, which goes up to about the uh, one time I lived on the 12th floor. So it, it was right up, right up there, right up in the, the rector's office, the boss's office, OK, which just wasted space. And when you go into the building, you find this huge atrium. The only people in it are two receptionists who sit in their little you know, reception desk. And they have to be kept warm in the winter. They have to be kept you know, cool in the summer. right? And there's nothing there. It's, it's just a huge amount of wasted space right? Um, with glass walls on the side, so heat loss is high. But that's one issue. But the issue I, I, I took out with my, my big boss said, hey, you know, you know we've, got all these, we've got all these flat spaces here, 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 here. And we came up with one of my colleagues, we came up with two ideas. One idea was we had a cafe. We got some umbrellas and some chairs and one of these, one of these spaces we could, we, could, we could use as a cafe because we didn't have a canteen inside the building. We had to go out to, to eat, right? OK. But so the other was this is perfect for urban farming. Why don't we plant? these totally wasted empty spaces, which are not used for anything. They have no function in the building. They're just empty, wasted spaces. I could never persuade him that it would be a great idea if we started urban gardening at the UN building. I thought this was a brilliant idea, partly because you know, we could grow vegetables and so on, right? Okay. But partly because I thought it would send a kind of message to people around that, hey, you know, even in a city, you can do quite fun things if you have flat spaces, right? And in some, in some architectural styles, if you go to North America, for example, the typical architectural style is to have flat roofs. If you go to Europe, it's often the pointed roof. And in Germany, for example, that's because of heavy snow, right? But those flat roofs make perfect urban gardens. And in some cases in the States, people have indeed, there are many, many experiments in urban gardening where space is not wasted. You can grow huge amounts of food in the city. You don't have to go to the countryside, right? 
And you don't even need soil because you can do it through what is called hydroponic gardening, where you have a growing medium which you feed from a drip method. You, you, you provide the nutrients through a kind of drip method, which is very effective in terms of water use. Okay, And you don't actually need soil. You can grow in an artificial, you can use wood chips or, or other kind of waste products from, say, a wood, wood yard or something like this, stuff they throw away and burn. You can recycle into the medium for your growing. So there are lots of questions, though we have to also face this question of how do you get from a smaller experiment to a big experiment? And is that possible? And if it is, should we promote those kind of alternatives as, as kind of social policy? You know, we should spread the word about those possibilities to persuade people that there are much more sustainable ways of providing foodstuffs or whatever, okay? So far, so good. How are we for time? Oh, as usual, we're right on time, five minutes right. Any, any comments and questions about the issue? So the key question today is what sustainability means and the issues that surround it when we try to define it and think about how we would practice it. Any, any thoughts or comments on? Yeah. Um, you have mentioned about the sharing economic or so the sharing economic. A sharing economy, economy yes. Sharing yeah. sources. Yeah. Do, you think, do you think it will finally like lead to a decrease for the total economic? Or, because the consumption is a very yeah. key. Some, some people have suggested this is already happening in certain, in certain ways. You probably don't immediately think of sharing economies, such as Uber. If you have a good taxi network and you have the app, you can summon a taxi and they, they show up, you don't need a car. It's much simpler not to have a car because they're expensive to buy. You have to maintain them. You have to buy road tax. You have to buy all this kind of stuff, right? You know, all I need to do is, is call an Uber taxi and it comes. Hopefully, right? Usually they do. And uh, in principle, that would be an example of a sharing economy. Say the, the use of, of utilities in the house, like washing machines and you know, vacuum cleaners, other shared resources, um, carpooling, where people who are commuting along fairly regular routes. This is done in some countries. So, some countries have made this, in a sense, compulsory. Singapore is a good example. The central business district of Singapore is banned to private cars. It used to be in the mornings. Now it's all day, <laughs> okay? Taxis can go in, I think. I think taxis go in. I think so. I hope they can. The idea was that uh, if you wanted to go in your private car, you had to buy a license for that day. It was only valid for that day, okay? Or you had to have at least four people in the car. So what people have done is simply establish things like, like a little bus stop outside the central business district where people wait for, you know, I, I, I want to go into the central business district. I stop there and I find three other people. I can take you all into the, the city. So the number of cars entering the, the, the central city is dropped by at least 75%. Uh, so congestion is low, you know, uh, traffic pollution levels, air quality is better, and that kind of thing. So, I mean, there are already some examples of that around, but maybe it's an idea that needs to be promoted more, not because it's not technically quite easy, but just the psychology of it, you know? I don't know about here in Japan. I mean, in India, one problem with car ownership is that having a car is a sign of status. You know the traffic's terrible, you know the pollution is awful in the big cities, you know you're going to spend half your time sitting in a traffic jam, you still want a car. One of the big industrial companies in, in India called Tata, T-A-T-A, -T -A, I mean they're very well known, I mean they, they have huge industrial complex, right? Uh, came up with this idea about five years ago to produce a cheap car. It's called a Nano, and it's a little car, it's, it's not highly powered. I mean, it's small. The idea was it's small, so easy to park, easy to do this kind of stuff, and you hardly ever see them. And I asked somebody, I said, well, where, occasionally you would see a Nano. You say, oh, there's a Nano. You know, I, I haven't seen one for days, right? Where are all the Nanos? It turned out that the Tata people were not good sociologists. 
their big mistake was that people didn't want to buy a cheap car. All right? If I couldn't afford a proper, a proper car, right, a big one, I would prefer to have a motorbike. Okay, so people would either stick with their so-called two two wheeler, a, a motorbike or a scooter, or they would then they would save up until they could buy what they regarded as a respectable car. So the Nano was a marketing failure because although the principle was good, you know, a cheap, low-powered car, small, etc., was a great idea. They hadn't thought about the sociology, right? They hadn't thought that people didn't want one because it was a cheap car, okay? So I think, I think with sharing economy, one of the key questions is to overcome that kind of psychological resistance, you know? It's okay not to own something yourself because you can share it with, with other people, like my artists in their common, I think at least like six families use one car. And quite effective most of the time. Obviously, you could see times that there would be conflicts over who wanted to use it. But in principle, this, this had a huge impact. You could do a simple experiment. Okay, you can do it right after class if you like. If you remember between now and Wednesday, when you're waiting to cross the road, count the number of cars that have just one occupant. Okay, and I, I used to do this. I mean, when I when I lived in Tokyo to go home, I had to cross one one busy road, and sometimes I was like waiting for the traffic light, and I, I would start doing this, you know, and you'd probably find that at least seventy five percent of the vehicles had one person inside. The other twenty five percent, so I had two. Sometimes a car was full. But mostly they were single occupant cars, which is one of the least efficient ways of arranging your urban transport, if you think about it, right? A large metal object, burning fuel, creating heat, waste, and pollution to simply move one person around. Not rational if you use your imagination, but that, that's, I think imagination becomes one of the key questions here, right? So let's look at some of these examples on Wednesday. Wednesday, right? This week again? Yeah? Okay. Thank you then. See you same time, same place on Wednesday. Good. Thank you.